Hello everybody, my name is Basundara Ghosh. I am a postdoc working at the Department of Physics, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. So this project is based on a work we did last year at the Heidelberg University with Professor Bjorn Schaefer and his students. And it recently got published in the Open Journal of Astrophysics. So first I want to start by giving an overview of what intrinsic alignments are. So intrinsic alignments are basically Astrophysical effects that arise due to the fact that nearby galaxies are subjected to a local tidal gravitational field that influences the process of the formation and also their shapes and sizes. So intrinsic alignments are basically understood to be contaminants of, on top of the weak lensing signals. So weak lensing signals are basically that which act at a distance. They are integrated effects unlike intrinsic alignments which are local effects. So in intrinsic alignments, as you can see from this simple cartoon picture, when we have a dark matter distribution uh, here shown by this gray uh, structure, so we understand that the dark matter distribution has a tidal gravitational field of its own that uh, it influences on nearby galaxies. And accordingly, galaxies in the vicinity of that distribution will tend to get aligned in a particular direction or experience a change in their shape or size. And we know that similar kind of effects like change in shape or size that we call shear or convergence, these are also experienced in weak lensing signals. So that is how it becomes difficult to distinguish between the distortion caused due to intrinsic alignments and due to weak lensing. Next, what I want to talk about is that there are basically two types of alignments that we generally understand. One is the linear alignment model, which is also called tidal shearing. It is understood to be uh, seen in elliptical galaxies. And in spiral galaxies, we know of something called a quadratic alignment model, which is also called tidal talking. So the basic difference is that in case of elliptical galaxies, we uh, understand the distortion of the change in shape or the resultant ellipticity to have a linear relationship with the tidal gravitational field that is causing it. And in case of spiral galaxies, which is understood to follow a quadratic alignment model, uh, the relation is not just linear, it is of a higher order. And also the distortion is caused due to a torquing effect, which also determines the angular momentum of the spiral galaxy. But the uh, catch is that this has not been significantly detected by observations. And simulations like illustrious TNG, they point at the possibility that the alignments of spiral galaxies can also follow a similar alignment model as elliptical galaxies, namely the linear alignment model, but with a significantly weaker alignment amplitude. So keeping this in mind, uh, our talk is, uh, our work is motivated by the fact that uh, can we propose a, a unified alignment model that can cater to both elliptical and spiral galaxies. So the underlying principle is as follows. We assume that in spiral galaxies, the stars that are moving at the edge of the galaxy are moving in a circular orbit. And when that uh, particular galaxy, that this galaxy gets subjected to a gravitational tidal field, it undergoes a distortion effect uh, that can cause them to assume an elliptical shape. And uh, uh, we are assuming that these orbits are bound by NFW halo potentials and uh, consequently the ellipticity of these stellar, stellar orbits, they should be linear in the external tidal shear. So uh, what we do here is to perform a perturbative calculation to compute the effect of a quadrupolar tidal gravitational field on a circular orbit and then we see that this naturally generates an ellipticity that is proportional to the magnitude of the tidal field. And we further perform some direct nu uh, numerical simulations to uh, look how the orbit of the star gets perturbed in the NFW halo. And we eventually see that the strength of the alignment for disk galaxies is smaller than that of the elliptical galaxies, which can be seen via uh, the you know, ellipticity spectra that we will be plotting. So I'll next uh, make some scaling arguments and draw the analogy between elliptical galaxies and disk galaxies. So firstly, for elliptical galaxy, as I said already, we it is well established that, that they undergo a linear alignment model. So uh, undergo uh, alignment under the linear alignment model. So assuming that uh, an elliptical galaxy is in viral equilibrium with a velocity dispersion sigma viral square, uh, we can have a relation like this where uh, epsilon L is 
the ellipticity of the elliptical galaxy and it is subjected to a tidal shear that is given by this potential phi and we have this uh, relation where the proportionality is coming via the radial radius square and the scaling is done with respect to the velocity dispersion square and analogously for a disk galaxy we can have a similar relation uh, so here we have a quadrupolar tidal field that distor distorts the edge of the galactic disk and it compresses it in one direction and elongates it in the perpendicular direction, making it elliptical, as I mentioned previously. And following the same scaling argument as before, we can have a similar kind of relation. So S epsilon sp here is the ellipticity of the spiral galaxy. And instead of r v real, what we have here is r s, which is called the scale radius of the disk galaxy or um, the, and it corresponds to the edge of the galactic disk. And the scaling here, instead of the velocity dispersion, it is done with respect to the circular velocity of the disk galaxy. So next I will tell you, uh, how do we perform this perturbation, perturbative calculation that I talked about? So we know that the circular motion of a star at the edge of the galactic disk, so, uh, about the circular orbit that it is going around. It is a superposition of two harmonic oscillations in perpendicular directions. So it has a natural frequency, angular frequency of small omega is uh, V circular divided by RS, and it has a phase shift of pi by two. So the effective potential pi will be uh, some of the terms that contain this natural frequency as well as a perturbative term that we have introduced here. It is in, in terms of uh, capital omega. And uh, if we consider a single oscillation in the x direction, uh, which we uh, describe in terms of a sinusoidal function because it is an oscillating function, then the equation of motion for the perturbed amplitude capital delta t is given by this equation. So, uh, if we were to evaluate delta t at delta of t at value 0 and pi by 2 for the phase omega t, we get distortions uh, proportional to 1 plus minus capital omega square by small omega square and the plus and minus correspond to semi-major and the semi-minor axis of the ellipse uh, respectively. And that eventually results in the ellipticity of the form here. And if you see on the far right hand side, you go back to the scaling argument that I talked about in the previous slide. So we can validate this using a, a direct numerical simulation. And uh, we already see that there is a linear reaction of the galactic shape to the quadrupolar tidal field. And uh, this validates our scaling arguments and perturbative calculations. So first we have to determine the equation of motion that we have to simulate. And we express it here uh, in terms of X where X is uh, a dimensionless variable, uh, which is a ratio of two radii. So R is the radius as we move away from the center of the galaxy and RS is the characteristic scale radius that I talked about earlier. And tau is the product of the angular frequency and time. And uh, finally, we have the equation of motion as follows. And here, here it is to be noted that this uh, fraction which has b in the numerator and a in the denominator can be written as follows for x equal to 1 that means r is equal to rs and uh, a here is a function of the concentration parameter which is a function that tells us um, at what redshift how much mass is concentrated in the galaxy so it is a function of the virial mass and the redshift inside the galaxy okay so uh, the result of the direct num numerical simulation is as follows. So at the top, you can see that is the epsilon plus component of the ellipticity. And uh, the tidal field that we apply here is omega square x square minus y square divided by 2. And in the bottom panel, the tidal field is omega square x, y. So it is uh, uh, the diagonal components essentially. And uh, this leads to the uh, epsilon cross component of the ellipticity. And just to put some numbers, uh, in dimensional less coordinates, if we have omega square is 0 0.04, it produces an ellipticity of around 0.1. So as you can see, the perturbed uh, orbits are the uh, green lines and the unperturbed one is the blue line and the perturbation is quite, quite noticeable. So we have an understanding of how the 
perturbation works and what kind of alignment we are getting with the help of this direct numerical simulation. Now, a fundamental question that arises is that how are the linear alignments for elliptical and spiral galaxies different? So, uh, the basic answer is that while the reaction of an elliptical galaxy as a virilized sphere to an external field is homologous, that means it is uh, it is not varying depending on the radius of the uh, radius from the center of the galaxy. But in case of an uh, of a spiral galaxy, that is not the case because the induced ellipticity of the orbit of a star is a function of the radius, which means that stars that are more uh, on more distant orbits get less tightly bound, and therefore they are more susceptible to tidal distortion, and which is also how we uh, understand our results. So, uh, from the previous scaling argument that we have, we can have a simple relation between the two kinds of alignments. So on left-hand side, you have the ellipticity of the spiral galaxy. And on the right-hand side, you have the ellipticity of the elliptical galaxy. And this uh, uh, ratio between the radii and the ratio between the velocity dispersion, the circular velocity, these play an important part. So we will take up these uh, shortly. So this particular ratio, the ratio between the scale radius and the virial radius squared, it is a function of the concentration parameter, very simply, which I just mentioned, uh, the function of the um, virial mass and the redshift. So this is uh, the factor by which the alignment parameter of the disk should be smaller than that for ellipticals. So as you know, x here in the plot, it is a ratio between the radius from the center and the scale radius, so we have r is equal to rs. So with increasing x, which means with increasing distance from the center of the galaxy, we see an increase in the ellipticity, which is what we expect, as I said, because the more uh, distant orbits that we are looking at, where the stars are uh, located, they are less and less tightly bound, and that's why they are more susceptible to tidal distortion by the surrounding tidal gravitation field. And the other um, ratio that we had in the previous relation was the ratio between the velocity um, uh, dispersion squared and the circular velocity squared. And uh, it is actually inversely proportional. That ratio is inversely proportional to the concentration parameter. So here we can see this relation that uh, gives us the ratio between circular velocity and velocity dispersion squared is uh, in terms of the concentration parameter, as we can see here. And if you see on the see the plots on the left hand side, on the top panel, we have the plot of the concentration parameter versus the halo mass, which is seen to decrease with increase in halo mass. So the more the halo mass is, the lesser the concentration parameter, which has, suggests that the uh, inverse ratio of this relation up here, that is sigma V real square divided by V circular square, is supposed to increase with time. So uh, this is what we observe in the lower uh, uh, plot here on the left hand side. So this scaling of concentration parameter with redshift and halo mass, it is derived from the numerical model that was proposed by Child et al. in 2018. So we have plotted it from that particular um, model. And uh, to understand the numbers a little bit, so the squared velocity ratio, it typically assumes a value close to one. So if you look at the mass range between 10 to the power 11 and 10 to the power 12 solar masses, you'll see that the value is typically between 0.9 and 0.5 at redshift of 0 0.1. So you have to look at the, so we are looking at the NFW profile here, which is given in the solid lines. And um, um, these values are typically of the order of one. So what that suggests is that this particular uh, ratio can be considered unity and then the scaling is mo mostly in terms of the uh, ratio of the uh, radii. So the ratio between the scale radius and the virial radius uh, is what determines the uh, alignment parameter of the disk in terms of the uh, alignment of the ellip elliptical galaxies. So now if we see the ellipticity spectra, uh, we can understand that for a nuclide-like survey with mean redshift 0.9, uh, what kind of 
difference in amplitudes we get for the different kinds of correlations. And in this uh, plot, we have only shown autocorrelations for simplicity and that also for three beams. So what you see here on the y-axis is the ellipticity spectra, uh, which is normalized by lensing. So uh, we divide the in ellipticity spectra for spirals and elliptical galaxies with the shear shear uh, uh, correlation, which we get from the weak lensing signals. So uh, let us understand the plot. Um, so the green curves that are very, very prominent, they're actually the spiral galaxies having a quadratic alignment uh, uh, model. And the purple ones are spirals having linear alignment model, but uh, they are correlated with the lensing signal. That's why we have it correlated with uh, gamma, which is the shear signal. And red is the spirals that are uh, having linear alignment model, but this is the intrinsic signal. So as you can see, the red ones are the lowest, which means the, the lowest amplitude. And the dashed lines are ellipticals having the linear alignment model. So those are the uh, dashed purple and dashed red lines. And they are uh, pretty much above the uh, spirals linear. So what we understand here is that the angular momentum-based quadratic alignment model, it over predicts the effect. And the linear alignment model for spiral galaxies, it evades detection in earlier data sets because the amplitude is very, very low. So that's why so far they have not been uh, observed, the linear alignment of spiral galaxies. But we believe that Euclid uh, can detect them and these spectra actually fall within the range of Euclid is what we have calculated. So to summarize, uh, what we have done here is to come up with a unified linear alignment model for elliptical and spiral galaxies. So we have performed here a perturbative calculation to derive the perturbative effect of a quadrupolar tidal gravitational field on a circular orbit. And we saw that this model produces naturally an ellipticity which is proportional to the magnitude of the tidal field. Um, so we set up a direct simulation of the orbit of a star inside the gravitational potential of an NFW halo and uh, this confirmed our, our perturbative results. And we then established the difference between, the basic difference between the kind of linear alignment that spiral and elliptical galaxies experience. And uh, then uh, we saw the ellipticity spectra for both kinds of galaxies and for spiral galaxies, both the linear and the quadratic alignment. And we understood that ellipticity spectra that results from the linear alignment model naturally resembles those of elliptic elliptical galaxies. And the intrinsic spectra that we have shown here are within the reach of Euclid. So we expect uh, Euclid to find some signal for uh, linear alignment of spiral galaxies. Okay. Thank you for your attention.